Outrocast. I appreciate everyone taking the time here. I know everyone wants to speak to the cast of Ike Boys, but oh, first off, did I say the name of the film correctly? You said it absolutely correctly. Well done. That means I saw the movie because I can only imagine that. Your new movie, Ike Boys. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there you go. But making sure that everyone gets the chance to speak. Uh, Eric, when did you actually finish the film? Because photography is different from editing. Yeah, uh, well, it was a lot. Uh, so uh, first of all, thank you for watching it. Thank you for the good question. Um, it uh, was a long process, made a bit longer by COVID, um, but it would have been a long process anyways. Um, so we finished filming uh, uh, February 2020. So you can do the math and you know understand what started happening in the world just a couple of weeks later. Um, so we were really blessed. Um, now, I think if there had been no pandemic, uh, things would have taken a little less long, but uh, you know, the, the reality of it is that there were six minutes of hand-drawn animation and 525 yes. visual effects shots. And, you know, it, it was just, it was a, and I think 13,000, over 13,000 individual audio files. Um, so it's, you know, it, 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 it is definitely an epic on a shoestring. Um, and so, but we had time and that was the advantage of the pandemic. So we finished uh, in May. Wow. Yeah. You answered a lot of questions right there because I was going to ask when the animation was done with relation to the actual filming. But letting the wonderful cast speak here, I'm going to work this round table and first go to Quinn and say, Quinn, how much research was actually needed for this movie? Because we do see you speak Japanese within the first few minutes of the film. <laughs> um, I do not speak fluent Japanese. Eric, however, was uh, very fluent in Japanese, also English, well, his main language. And uh, he was able to translate a lot of what uh, I was supposed to say and sort of break it down into, you know, syllables. And I was sort of memorizing it like that and reciting, you know, the syllables in the correct order, which made it a little bit tougher to memorize. But I eventually caught on and started learning a few Japanese words here and there. So um, I'm nowhere near close to, you know, actually knowing Japanese language as a whole. Um, but it was, it was definitely a unique challenge that I enjoyed tackling. There you go. Christina, how much research was needed for this role for you? So actually, I mean, when I first got the role, it was a foreign exchange, Jap like totally Japanese foreign exchange student who can't really speak English. And English is my first language. Right. And then Japanese, even though I grew up in, in Japan. Um, so... I, that was definitely a challenge because I had never had to speak with an accent. Although like my grandparents and my family members around me, I've heard them speak with an accent. So luckily I was co like just planning to go to Japan right before filming. So I was like, okay, I need to do my research. <laughs> and so I was just listening to how everyone was speaking. I worked with a dial, a Japanese dialect coach who just kind of for like a week and he just listened to how I was speaking the full Japanese scenes. Cause that, I speak Japanese, but there's little things that make me sound not fully native. Like it's just a little bit mixed. Right. So he kind of went through the script with me and was like, okay, change. So there was definitely some research that I had to do for, for Miki. But once I kind of locked into her character, it, it, it was, yeah, it flowed well. There you go, Mr. Gandhi. I've left you out. <clears throat> Please tell me about your research methods for this film. Um, so I, I would say that there actually wasn't much for me. I felt very connected and, and with one with the character already. He's a pretty goofy guy. I'm a pretty goofy guy. But the only thing that I really wanted to do research wise was uh, Eric gave us like a list of movies to watch to, to get into the headspace. And like he made a playlist for me, too. So I listened to that. Uh, but the main thing that I did was I watched uh, an anime called uh, Neon Genesis Evangelion, and then I watched the Cornetto trilogy. So those are the main things that I did. And then obviously just like hang out at this big tall goofball and that's it. That was it. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, Eric. Did you have anybody trying to talk you out of having such an ambitious project? And by that, I mean the animation, the visual effects, et cetera. Oh, interesting. Um, so... I think, uh, wow, um, you know, I think I just kind of was so brazenly single-minded in doing it um, that I, I kind of, I, I think I avoided 
I, I avoided instinctively the people who would have tried to talk me out of it. Um, there's also a fair amount of, uh, of sort of collecting on previous investments with this. I mean, so, you know, the animation, th those, I knew those animators from, uh, you know, years ago when I was, uh, w when I was working at an animation studio in Japan and, you know, and a, a lot of it, you know, it, there's a lot of the ambitious elements in this film that I do think I took my time and, you know, did my homework and, you know, learned from the mistakes of others to, I think, to earn the right to do it. So, I don't know. I mean, I, uh, I, I think I put myself in circumstances where, you know, I had done my homework and I was with people who, you know, understood the ambition and were supportive of it. Fair. In yeah. other words, you worked with encouraging people who said, yeah, it's possible. And you got a shoestring budget movie done that looks like it's a many, many million dollars kind of movie. Now, one thing that I couldn't figure out, the setting is Oklahoma per se. Yep. Was it actually filmed in Oklahoma? It was, yes. Whereabouts yeah. in Oklahoma did it take uh, place? So uh, Oklahoma City. Um, and there's, uh, you know, and, and the origin then, honestly, is it's, you know, I grew up in Oklahoma City and first feature film, it's, you know, it, I mean, it is actually connects to the previous question, but it's people I know, it's people who, you know, I could call in favors with. Um, and it's also, you know, really, it's, it, it, it was a place where I could be authentic with it. Um, and it was really important to me to, you know, be as sincere as possible. And, you know, a lot of it is I, as much of like, I thought it, as much as I could be true to my own lived reality, like that, you know, I knew that would make the film better and that would make something that would be universal and the audience would connect with. So, you know, like the school, uh, all the school scenes, that's the school I grew up at. Um, and like the stone playground structure where the boys are testing out their powers and where they conclude their fight. Like that's, uh, that's where I skinned my knee for the first time in kindergarten. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of little things like that in the film that, you know, no one is going to know that consciously, but I do think that those details add up and that, you know, viewers sense sincerity and they sense authenticity. For um, sure. And, you know, like the, the first the first note that you hear in the film on, on the contrabass, uh, that's uh, that's my high school music teacher playing the bass there. So it's just a lot of a lot of little things. Wow. As somebody who does travel writing, I've had the pleasure of going to Oklahoma a few times. And I know that The Outsiders was filmed in Tulsa. Yeah. So was uh, the movie UHF, the Weird Al Yankovic staple movie. But I'm curious to see if other people have filmed in Oklahoma before this. Christina, was this your first Oklahoma filming experience? Yes, first time in Oklahoma, that part of the US ever for me. Quinn, same deal? Uh, yes, first time in Oklahoma. <laughs> wow, Ronick? Yes, also great time <laughs> in my life. Loved being there, very open. Uh, they welcomed us, so I first time and, and uh, great first impression. Wow. Okay. So Eric, you made a lot of firsts happen as a result of this, which is wonderful. So being mindful of everybody's time here, I wanted to find out what's next because the reality is when, as somebody does interviews, you know, five, six days a week, you'll yeah. say, so when did you film this movie? And people go 2017 and you go, yeah. Oh, okay. So you must've made four things since then. Christina, you first, what's next? Are you allowed to say, or are you under a deadline.com embargo? <laughs> yes, I believe I'm allowed to say. Um, I have a Netflix limited series that I'm on coming out next year called From Scratch and a feature film directed by Tig Notaro and Stephanie Allen. Wow. Coming out next year. I don't know which one's coming out first, but yeah, stay tuned. Working with Tig Notaro as a, a producer, director type, not filmed at Oklahoma, correct? No, Los Angeles. There you go. <laughs> Quinn, what's next for you? I'm currently filming season two of the Netflix series Firefly Lane. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just up here, which is why I'm not able to physically attend Fantastic Fest at the moment. So it kind of sucks, but, you know, I got uh, season two to do. So it's exciting <laughs> time. Hence the background listing all those cities because those <laughs> places inevitably you're going to be in some form. Yeah, Munich? these are all the places the uh, that EK Boys will will premiere eventually. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that must be exciting. Uh, Ronick, 
Uh, right now, just DK boys. So hopefully that's uh, full steam ahead for now. Yeah. So it must be an exciting project because it, you show a lot of depth in this kind of film. So pigging back on that, Ronick, when you saw the script, did you know it was that great? Or did you only get a few pages of the script and showed up and then saw it all later? Uh, I think I think I had the whole script before my first audition. Um, the one thing that that really jumped out for me personally uh, was that I love that my character, even though he was Indian, there wasn't a lot of like play up on on his ethnicity. I could just yeah. be myself and, and that was enough. And that's something I really appreciate and gravitated towards. So that was the one thing that stood out. And then obviously the goofiness that I spoke about earlier. Yeah, you basically had the Sam Levine freaks and geeks role of Neil, <laughs> but in a great way. So kudos yeah. to you on that. Eric, yeah. what's next? Besides having to do tons more interviews and film festival Q&As, <laughs> and because for you, this is going to keep going for another year or so, but tell uh, me more. Well, uh, I, I, that's a, a very exciting prospect. Um, I, I love talking about something I care about. So, you know, I, I am working very hard and I'm planning the next year to get EK boys in front of as many people as possible and set it up for long-term success. Um, so I've been working very hard on uh, the next film that I intend to make. Um, and I'm going to be a little bit secretive right now, but it, you know, basically it's, it, it's the film that I have wanted to see since around age 12 and, you know, picking up context clues this conversation of my love of dinosaurs, love of monsters, um, you know, love of swashbuckling adventure. It's, it, it is that movie. Um, I, I want to make, I, it's something that, uh, it, it, I want to make one of those movies that people like they see when they're kids, they love it. They think it's the shit. Then they see it a couple decades later and realize, oh, there's a lot of depth to that. So, uh, it's, it, it, it's a grown up movie about the human condition made for 12 year olds is what I will say. So you're making monster squad, the sequel. Yes. <laughs> Exclusive. You hear it first. Well, yeah. <laughs> thank you all for your time and congratulations on getting a great movie like this out into the world. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks all. Take care and looking forward to your next projects. Thank so you. much. Thank you.